What's up guys? Uh, today I have another video for you. Um, today I'm going to be discussing this pen <laughs> again. Uh, this is my Pelican M600 and I'm basically going to discuss the modification that I've done to a Pelican M200 nib unit uh, in order to make it uh, more flexible. Uh, you know, as you can see from uh, these three pens up here, uh, I have a dip pen with um, a relatively flexible nib. Uh, I also have a Noodler's Nib Creeper uh, demonstrator, and I also have, I think, a 40s or 50s era Waterman 92, uh, you know, and this happens to me be my uh, my vintage flex pen. Um, and as you can see here, I basically have my M600, but I have an M200 steel nib unit in there with some modifications to the nib unit. Uh, I'm not sure how clearly you'll be able to see it, um, but you know I'm just gonna kind of go into a little bit of background before I really get in depth into this modification. Um, you know, in the fountain pen world, you find that a lot of people want um, a flex nib. Oh, focus! Uh, a lot of people want a flex nib, um, and uh, usually there are two routes. Well, three routes you could go about it. Uh, there aren't really standard modern flex pens anymore. Uh, a very popular one, um, at least from factory, is the Namiki Falcon. Uh, either the uh, the Metal Falcon or the Resin Falcon, or uh, I believe in Japan it's called the, uh, the Labo. Um, those kind of have a soft nib, uh, but, you know, I believe Namiki, Pilot Namiki themselves say that it's not really meant to be a flex nib. It's meant to just be a soft nib that adds a little bit of character um, to your writing. Uh, and, you know, it, it's nice for things like um, characters, like writing characters instead of just writing um, Roman alphabet because, you know, with certain strokes you can have a thicker stroke and then other strokes you have a thinner stroke. You know, the line variation is kind of nice, um, but they say, and most people agree, it's not really a flex pen. Uh, it's definitely not a full flex pen. It, it's, you know, at best you can consider it like a semi-flex pen um, and you can kind of, you know, you can damage the nib if you try and flex it out too much. Uh, and also people have a lot of problems with uh, railroading with that pen. You know, the feed doesn't really keep up. And that's because that pen just isn't really made to be a full flex pen. Uh, now, when you have something like a dip pen, you know, this flexes out quite a bit. Like, if you look at it, you can see, like, with very minimal pressure, I'm not use really using a lot of pressure, but I can spread the tines out a lot. Uh, and, you know, this is great for people who do calligraphy writing. Um, if you're doing something like copper plate or Spencerian, um, you know, you can get very thin hairlines and then all of a sudden you can get nice big swells. Uh, and it's nice and all, but it does have the inconvenience of having to dip the pen um, either after a few letters or even after one letter, depending on how big the letter is and how much you will flex the nib out and make the swell. Uh, you know, you'll use up the ink reservoir that is contained on the bottom of the nib. Um, for me, it's not a huge issue. I don't really mind dipping. Um, usually, if I'm doing any sort of flex writing, it'll be in the comfort of my own uh, home. Uh, so I can slow, you know, and it'll be a more relaxed environment where I can slow down, dip the pen in, and uh, do whatever writing I have to. Uh, my biggest issue is a matter of convenience in um, maintaining this pen. Um, dip pens are not made out of stainless steel. Uh, you know, these are steel. I believe they also make gold dip pen nibs, I'm not really sure, uh, but these are, at least the ones that I have, and the majority of the inexpensive ones, you know, that you could buy for a dollar or two a piece, um, they're made out of a st uh, steel that is not stain resistant and will rust. Uh, that means that when you're done with the pen, you can't just leave the pen there, you know, and expect it to function properly the next time you come around. Uh, if you actually look at this nib holder, I don't I don't think I'll be able to get it to focus, but um, yeah, I don't think you'll you won't really be able to see it. A bit well, actually, on top here, you can kind of see like a reddish, a reddish orange gleam there, uh, and that's because you know I I have um left a nib in here once before and it basically rusted in there. Uh, so that's kind of an inconvenience. You know, I know some people have taken pens uh, like the Nib Creeper or or other f uh, friction fit feed fountain pens and they've put um, dip pen nibs in and you know they don't have the inconvenience of having to dip because they have a feed that holds ink uh, and an ink reservoir in the form of like the piston reservoir or whatever uh, but the problem is you can't leave your pen like that 
you know, over a long period of time. Uh, when you're done with your writing, you have to take it apart, you have to clean and dry out the nib really well, or it'll rust on you. Um, then you have pens like the, um, the Nib Creeper, the Ahab, the Conrad, uh, basically the Noodler's Pen, uh, which is pretty revolutionary if you ask me, um, and I think most people would agree. It's a pen that you can get, like, really good flex with. Uh, it's uh, not a wet noodle by any mean. it means. It takes quite a bit of pressure, uh, but you can use a lot of pressure and spread out the tines quite a bit without really worrying about spraying the nib out. Uh, you know, and how Nathan accomplished that was basically doing a, a very long slit. You can see the slit basically goes all the way into this section, uh, into the feed. Uh, and these pens are great, you know, the Nib Creepers can be had for around $13, uh, Ahabs and Conrads can be had for around $20, uh, you could get the ones with the nicer bodies uh, made out of ebonite or um, the really nice swirly acrylics, and those are around $40. Uh, the problem with these pens is they're a little bit finicky, um, you know, one of the biggest complaints people have with this pen is like, you know, yeah, the flex is pretty good. Um, Nathan makes all his pens very user serviceable. You know, I can take apart this pen. I could take apart the piston, um, the piston mechanism. I could just pull the nib and feed out all by hand. I don't need any specialized tools. Uh, it, you know, the the resin that he uses, the vegetal resin he uses, does kind of have a funky smell that you kind of have to get used to. And I find that it never really goes away. Um, I, I, I guess you won't, won't really have that problem with the acrylic or the ebonite conrads. Uh, but in terms of re the resin ones, there is that smell. Uh, but they are finicky in the fact that you do have to tinker a lot with the feed, the alignment. Uh, you may even have to heat set the pen, uh, the feed to the nib, um, in order for it to write really well. Uh, so it's a little bit of a pain, but still overall pretty fun to play with uh, if you have the patience and you're willing to kind of put the time to learn. Um, then you have what most people recommend and most people go for, and that's Vintage Flex. Um, not all vintage pens have flexible nibs. Uh, a good majority of vintage pens will have semi-flex. Uh, there are still, you know, very few, like, complete wet noodle vintage pens. Uh, a lot of times they end up just breaking because people want to nice, do nice big swells and they end up just um, springing the, the nib anyway. Uh, that That's not to say all vintage pens will flex because in the past, you know, there were people using carbon copy, carbon paper to make carbon copies and you want like a nail of a, a pen to write through that. Um, but this, in this case, this happens to be my vintage flex and this does flex quite a bit. As you can see here, uh, you know, I, I generally don't really flex it much more than that. Uh, the person that I bought it from has had a writing sample and he showed definitely a lot more flex than this. But it's, uh, it, you know, it, it is a vintage pen. It's something that you do kind of have to be careful about. You don't have to necessarily baby it, uh, but you do want to be a little more gentle and not always push things to the extreme. Um, you know, regardless of whether it's new or old, uh, if you push things to their extremes, they'll have the tendency to fail. Um, so that get, gets back to basically what I have here. Uh, this is a piston fill, which is great. It holds a lot of ink. Uh, it's very easy to maintain, you know. Uh, one of my biggest gripes with vintage pens is that a lot of them have um, filling mechanisms that are not easy to maintain. I mean, granted, they're not difficult to maintain, but they do require, you know, things like lever fillers, anything with a sack in them. It does require a little bit of know-how uh, and does require some tools and... Um, you know, you need to buy the rubber sacks, you need to buy shellac and all that stuff. Uh, requires a little bit more maintenance than your standard piston converter. That's why, you know, this pen actually is not inked up. And I'm not going to ink this up for demonstration uh, because I'll have to go through the hassle of cleaning out a lever fill pen, which takes more time than a piston fill pen, that's for sure. Um, so what I wanted to do is ch to try and find a solution that I could do with a modern pen. Um, I think, I, like I said before, you know, with uh, the larger Pelican pen, you, you can kind of spread the tines more because the nibs are so big. Uh, you can kind of get some line variation with them, uh, but they're still not flex pens. Um, you know, I, I think you could also, you can get some pens like vintage pel Pelicans, uh, you know, 400s or 400 NNs where uh, you can get flexible nibs on them uh, because they were made in a time when the, uh, the gold nibs were softer and more flexible uh, and you still have a piston fill, but that requires shopping around and finding the right pen. Um, what I discovered is that the, um, 
the M200 nibs are, are a little soft. Uh, if you look, you can see that if you press them down a little bit, you can get a little bit of line variation. Uh, I, you know, I, I do find that um, this is actually my second take doing this. My battery died on the first take, so I apologize if I'm repeating anything. Uh, I kind of lost track of what I've said before. Um, but I do find that the uh, the M200 steel nibs actually write kind of softer than the M600 14 karat gold nibs. Um, I'm not really sure why. Uh, you know, I I do know that nib meisters will modify nibs to make them more flexible. Um, at least for Pelican, uh, Richard Binder will modify M400 nib units, uh, 14 karat gold uh, M400 nib units for flex, uh, for full flex. He, he won't do wet noodles uh, because he says it's too easy for people to spring the nib, but he'll do flex that requires a little bit of pressure. Uh, but you get really nice swells with those pens. Uh, but the problem is that they're expensive. Um, a gold M400 nib alone is like o just over $100. Uh, adding on his modification, his time and labor uh, adds on like another $100. So if you wanted to buy a nib unit for a Pelican that flexes, you're looking at paying like around two hundred five dollars, not including shipping, I believe. And I think if you want to go with the really extra, extra fine grinds, uh, that'll add to the cost as well. So I went ahead and said, you know what? I'm gonna try and um, grind the nibs to make it more flexible. You know, by no means am I a nibmeister, uh, but I have tinkered around with grinding nibs, smoothing them out, tuning them, uh, and I figured, you know, the worst thing that happens is that. I lose out on $30, you know, what, what this nib unit cost me, uh, which, yeah, for some people isn't necessarily cheap, but for me, I was like, well, you know, I, I've done enough nib work to kind of be relatively confident that I won't completely screw up the nib, uh, and the end result is what you have here in this pen. Uh, now, funny story about creating wet noodle pens and springing them is that I have actually already sprung this nib. Uh, I worked on this nib today after I got home from work. Uh, you know, the nib units got delivered today. And I'm going to put up this video today, uh, although who knows what time it'll be published. Um, I, I want them to do the video while everything was still fresh on my mind. I have sprung this un nib unit already. So I took it apart. I uh, knocked off the nib from the collar. And, you know, I knocked the feed and the nib out of the collar uh, to be able to get to grind a nib on my Dremel. And, you know, there were several things. If, if you take a look at the feed as it is right now, you can see that I actually ground a little bit of the bottom part there. Uh, those fins, I don't believe, will aff affect flow. Uh, those fins mainly, I think, are for excess ink coming out of the nib unit, uh, so it won't just drip out. Uh, you don't necessarily need bottom fins to... Um, facilitate good flow you know if you look at vintage pins like like my Waterman 92 has a completely flat bottom part to the feed uh, and feeds just fine because the um, the ink channels and the uh, breather breather lines are all on the top of the feed um, the reason I did that was I actually accidentally bent some of the fins I decided well you know since some of the fins are already bent it looks kind of ugly from the side uh, let me just kind of sand away at, uh, <laughs> at the bottom of the fin so that's the result you get here uh, what I basically did with this nib unit, as you can see, is I thinned out the shoulders, the sides of the tine, down to the shoulders. Um, if you compare it between the two, let's see if that'll get it to focus. It'll be a little further away, it won't be as up close, but the lighting is better down here, so you'll be able to see it. So, I'm not sure if you can tell, but I basically dropped the shoulders down to where the um, the writing is, uh, where it says Pelican. You can see the shoulder is just in line with the breather hole. Um, I brought it all on my ground nib, I brought it down to where the lettering is. And, that's the, and the reason why is that, as I took a standard nib unit and I was just kind of like bending it down and flexing it, I was looking at the steel and trying to find out what was stopping the tine from bending more. Uh, you know, some people will randomly grind scallops in the side of, side of their nibs and everything. Uh, I, I think the uh, the Falcon nib, uh, not the Namiki Falcon, but the FA nib that Pilot sells, they have scallops on the sides, and I think a lot of people just mimic that. Uh, and I guess it does kind of work. It does add to uh, the flexibility of the nib. Um, but what I wanted to do is see exactly where pressure was causing the nibs not to be able to spread anymore uh, you know and I found that it, it was just this area right above the writing on the nib that's where it says pelican right where the shoulder is next to the breather hole 
that area had a lot of excess stress, uh, and because the shoulder is there, I figured, okay, that's probably what's keeping the tines from not spreading. So I went ahead and I ground it. Uh, I, I had a few ideas of what I could do with um, this nib. Uh, you know, I could either just grind it out, uh, thin out the tines and see how well that worked out. Uh, I could also, some people have like drilled a secondary breather hole and extended the slit uh, to make it more like a uh, noodler's nib, flex nib, uh, you know, because obviously if the slit runs further up, the tines can spread more because it's not constricted by that area. And I thought about even maybe uh, messing around with the temper of the steel nib, although that will have less than consistent results, so I figured, let me just try and grinding it, uh, the tines out and seeing what the results are. And the results are, I've basically gotten a very flexible nib. Um, like I said, it's, it's very soft now. The nib as it is right now is actually softer than my Vintage Flex Pen. Um, you know, I do have some hard starting issues. Um, one of the things I ran across is that when I ground down the shoulders, um, the tine started spreading from the breather hole, I guess uh, from pressure, like outward pressure, uh, with the shoulders originally there, they would kind of squeeze the tines together so you had better uh, tine alignment. Uh, now they're a little bit spread further apart, so I do kind of have a bit of a baby's bottom issue uh, because the ink isn't reaching all the way to the tip of the nib. You know, if I write upside down, I can write with no hard starting issues, no problems whatsoever. Uh, and the nice thing about this nib is that because it has such a huge ball of tipping material, if I don't want any flex at all in my writing, I can just turn the pen upside down and I can just write normally with no problems. I actually get like an extra fine line. Uh, if I want flex, you know, because the nib is so soft now and takes very little pressure to actually flex the tines, um, it's actually hard for me to write relatively consistently. So, oops, and you can see I have hard starting issues. If you see, I write my name. Uh, there's a bit of line variation that you don't get when you write with the back end of the tine. Uh, but if you look at it now, so basically, as little pressure as I can use, and if I start using a little bit more pressure, and I can finally get it to railroad. Um, I actually discovered, like I said earlier, I can't really flex the nib any more than that. Uh, if I try flexing the nib more than that, I'll spring the time. <laughs> um, um, so I've already sprung the time once before and I've just knocked the nib out of the, uh, the feed and collar and everything and I kind of just forced the steel back into position, like unsprung it. Uh, but the problem is, you know, I feel you can only do that for so many times before the nib just like work hardens and just snaps or whatever. Uh, in general, I feel like most people kind of overswell their writing. Um, when you're doing any form of like flex writing, you don't want to always use the maximum amount of flex. You know, if you look at really beautiful copper plate or Spencerian writing, they don't use huge swells. It's actually a balance. Uh, it's more impressive for you to have like a very fine. Oops, hard starting issue. It's more impressive for you to have a very fine line and then just have a very slight swell instead of just having. Uh, okay line and then a huge swell that you know that writing like that just looks really fat and ugly so I don't really have any plans of flexing it more than this uh, so you see baby's bottom issue writing upside down has no problems but uh I kind of have to angle it up a little more and I have to write very slowly which unfortunately I'm out of screen and you can't even see him because my hand gets in the way yeah. Can I spring the tines again? No. There we go. So, you know, I, I really... You can't get decent line variation, and it is very soft. Uh, if I actually bring it up to hopefully where it'll focus, you can actually see, like, I'm not using any pressure at all, and it's basically flexing well apart. Uh, unfortunately, because there's no... the ink flow isn't proper, um, you can see that there's there's no ink in between where the tines are. Uh, I have found that so long as the ink is flowing properly um, and I have ink contact with the paper, 
I won't actually get that problem. Actually, I find that if I do a higher angle, there we go. So it's not really a feed problem because once I get it writing and there's good capillary action contact to the paper, I can flex rel and write relatively quickly without any flow issues at all. Uh, so, you know, what's happening is because I don't have good con ink flow contact to the paper, uh, it just railroads right away because um, capillary action just breaks away from the tip of the, the nib. So, I mean, that's all. Just like a quick thing. Uh, like I said, it wasn't really overly complicated. I just took the nib to my Dremel, ground the tines down, uh, ground the shoulder, lowered the shoulders, uh, and that's the result you see here. Uh, you know, I I'd venture to say that um, the, the tines spread, you know, just as easily as they do on my Waterman 92. Uh, you know, it's just as soft. I wouldn't really consider it a wet noodle by any means. Uh, you know, I personally don't think that my Waterman is a wet noodle, but it is, it is a full flex pen. And with this, you know, four steel nib, that's quite impressive. Uh, and the responsiveness is not actually that bad. Uh, although, thinking about it now, if I had to go back, I probably would have not ground the shoulders so low. So I have a little more pressure pressing the tines together uh, so I get a little bit more responsiveness because you know like I said the further you away you grind uh, down the shoulder the uh, the more time the tines will spread and that just gives you greater line width but if your feet can't keep up or you don't have good capillary action for a good flow uh, then it doesn't matter how far apart your tines will spread because um, you just won't be writing anything so uh, you know I, I do I bought three nib units, uh, a medium, and t two extra fines. Unfortunately, one that I got came in fine. Um, the sleeve, the, uh, the nib case said extra fine on it, so that's why I guess the seller put it in the envelope and sent it out to me, but the nib itself is a fine. Not a big deal, you know, I can grind the, f the nib down if I wanted to. And actually looking between uh, the extra fine and the fine nibs, uh, due to Pelican's quality controls and inconsistencies, the tipping size looked basically the same to me. So, I don't know about the long-term issues. Uh, like I said, I've already sprung the nibs. I do have to work on the flow. This is kind of annoying. I think once I get rid of the baby's bottom, if I grind uh, away more of the tipping material, I won't really have any issues. Because if I write at a higher angle, it writes just fine. So, except there should be an S there. So yeah. Uh, definitely not something that I would recommend you try at home. Uh, you know, you know, standard disclaimer that I probably should have started the video off with. Uh, I take no responsibilities for you messing up your pen if you if you decide to uh, take a Dremel to your your nib. Um, but like I said, because Pelicans are so versatile and that you can swap out the nibs for a relatively inexpensive price, it is a fun pen to experiment around with. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, hopefully I didn't ramble too much, uh, second take, so I've already repeated some stuff and I lost track of what I've said, but hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if I do any more modifications to either this nib or another nib unit, I'll definitely just make another video kind of discussing more about what I've learned and stuff. Uh, yeah, so thanks for watching, guys.